friends. Welcome back to another episode of Amory. I am, as always, so pleased to be here with you. So thank you for spending this time with us. I have an incredible guest on our podcast today, and I'm going to do him right by actually reading a proper bio because he is very distinguished in the area of non-monogamy. So today I have the pleasure of announcing or speaking with Dr. Heath Schesinger, an internationally recognized therapist, researcher, and consultant known for his groundbreaking work within the realm of family and relationship diversity. As a co-founder and executive director of the Modern Family Institute and co-founding uh, and founding co-chair of the Committee on Consensual Non-Monogamy housed in the LGBTQ Division of the American Psychological Association, Dr. Scheisinger has dedicated over a decade to studying the dynamics of both monogamous and non-monogamous relationships. He is also co-founder of the Polyamory Legal Advocacy Coalition and uh, affiliate faculty at the renowned Kinsey Institute and Indiana University. Dr. Scheisinger's work serves as a catalyst for both academic discourse and practical support, with his initiatives paving the way for a more nuanced understanding of what constitutes a healthy, fulfilling relationship in contemporary society. I have also had the pleasure of speaking to Heath numerous times personally. And Heath, I'm just so happy to hold a space here for you to come share your wisdom with the Emory listeners. So thank you, thank you for your time today. Good thing. I'm happy to be here, Megan. Thanks for having me. Oh my goodness. It, I'm almost not sure where to start because you <laughs> have such a breadth of experience and you know i before we we talked personally i looked at your mm -hmm. website and just saw all of these initiatives that you are a part of which is why i wanted to right. make sure i caught all of those uh, because you give a lot of your time to the community um, mm -hmm. serving on these committees uh being a voice of advocacy and really working on changing policy and laws, which we so desperately need, right, to make space. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, I'm sure your, your way on this road <laughs> is a bit long and traveled, but could you just give like a really quick summary, like what yeah. interested you in this, besides the fact that you're a therapist, um, yeah. why, like, why this topic and why do you think it's important? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, my path was a bit of planned happenstance, right? That my, my journey actually started with wanting to be a minister. And I was well on my way to becoming a minister and pursuing a master's degree in ministry. I'm not sure if I've shared that with you, but I've always been interested in wanting to help people and just wanting to contribute and be sweet and kind and thoughtful and have healthy relationships and support people in their journey. And then, Eventually, uh, I had some experiences that prompted me to feel a little bit constrained in that path. I started meeting a, a breadth of people that approached the world a bit differently than what I did. I started having my own experiences and my own curiosity toward uh, men, to be honest with you, and that that shifted my paradigm. And it prompted me to end up leaving my uh, the path that I was going down and decided to pursue a PhD in counseling psychology. And then from there, it felt like I experienced a similar form of stigma or prejudice when I started talking about how people are structuring their relationship and held curiosity about not just the gender that people who uh, are attracted to. There seemed like there was a lot of support within the field of psychology around mm -hmm. that, but there was a lot of stigma or felt like some very similar responses or opposition when I started talking about, well, what about how people seem to have the capacity to be drawn to loving more than one person? We, we, we can do this with children or with friends, but when mm -hmm. we talk about it in a romantic context, it felt like a very similar set of judgments or perspectives that were uh, being directed toward me in that context or towards those conversations. And I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm on to something here. Something just feels uh, unjust about mm -hmm. this, or it seems like that our, our framework is very narrow in terms of how we're thinking about love and relationships. And I just started to see how it felt like that this really may not be serving society when I started to consider Mm. some of the limitations or the challenges 
that modern families and nuclear families or that, that nuclear families were, were experiencing in the modern era. Mm hmm. Oh my goodness. Yes. Just yes, yes. And yes. And I just read a blog post of yours too, where you were talking about loneliness, that loneliness epidemic mm -hmm. and yeah. how that is, it just really is all pervasive. So could you speak a little bit more to that in the nuclear family and this epidemic of loneliness and how maybe consensual non-monogamy fits in there as a resource? Right. right. Yeah. I really, I mean, that's certainly a driving factor behind uh, I think I shared with you how I'm in the process of launching the Modern Family Institute, where really we're wanting to focus on continuing the work that I've been doing with some of these other projects, but with research and education and policy and practice that really supports families that fall outside of the nuclear family norm. And one of the big driving factors for wanting to launch this project was really seeing how an increasing number of people are experiencing loneliness, that we're experiencing, that we're in the midst of a loneliness epidemic, where nearly half of US adults report experiencing loneliness with high rates, especially among young adults, and how there are a number of health risks that are associated with loneliness, that it's equivalent to smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. A recent report just came out from the US Surgeon General around this and how loneliness contributes to increased risk for disease such as heart disease, stroke, anxiety, depression, dementia. And so we're seeing how this is something that's increasing, especially with uh, technology. And I think in part due to the pressures of, of wanting to fit into a nuclear family model, right? Which I really see as an experiment that took off more in the 1940s and mm. 50s and is influenced in part from capitalism and wanting mm -hmm. everyone to have a washer and dryer of their own, et cetera. And how that has pushed us in addition to technology and how people can work from home and don't have to leave their home as much. And we have more artificial intimacy that there's an increasing rates of loneliness and how this is really impacting families and relationships. And really my colleagues and I were having conversations about that and really wanting to do something about that. And I really see non-monogamy as one of many models that seem to be this movement toward uh, or, or kind of a balancing out of the drive toward uh, independence mm. and really getting back to a model that focused on mutualism or where there's mm -hmm. redundancy in our support system and that non-monogamy is just one of those options and one of the the forms of relating that we're seeing on the rise i think in part due to response to the increased isolation and and the pressures that have come from the increased isolation that we're experiencing today oh my gosh i want to take this conversation about three directions <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just right. one first <laughs> One, uh -huh. a personal story. So before Marty and I opened up our relationship, for a decade, we lived in a townhome before we had kids, almost a decade, yep. and it had extra bedrooms. So we had friends live with us. And yep. our, you know, we had one friend live with us for five or six years, another one for two or three, and they were like family. So yep. I realized we already had a more open structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we were already feeling that and wanting it. And both Marty and I are very similar. We're like, we're happier when we've got more social structures and pe like people around us that we can connect to. And honestly, took the burden off of, eat, you know, one of it's the same thing as non-monogamy, right? Taking the burden off of meeting all of those needs. And I remember mm -hmm. telling some friends, they just thought it was so weird. They're like, you have a friend yep. that lives with you for five years? Like, don't you and Marty want time? It's like, we have time. We got plenty of space. It just, it adds to our life. So it's so interesting. And another note on that is, you know, you brought up the research. Isn't there a very famous longevity study, um, like by Harvard, I think, on the people that live the longest? Actually, the variable that is the single most important piece is their social network. Um, I mean, isn't that important information that we should be looking at? Everybody's working on popping these pills and everything. It's like, hey, hey. It's our social network. We're social creatures. <laughs> right. What do you think yeah, about I have, that? I have so much curiosity about that, right? Because I think I, I completely agree that, that non-monogamy is just one 
model. And people talk about how non-monogamy is one of the benefits is that it helps them connect with more people, develop more intimacy. But there's, there's many different models of having more social support in our lives. And what you're talking about is where you're having more friends or biological family, right? I think there's, there's many different ways to go about this. And it's, it's so interesting to me. And really what we're, I'm, I'm wanting to try to speak to in the work that I'm doing is just be engaging in thoughtful dialogue from a bipartisan perspective of just, mm. Hey, we all seem to be struggling with this concept of, of, of loneliness or isolation. And how are these constructs that we have these blinders or these, these invisible forces that prompt us to think a particular way about what family should look like or what relationships should look like and simply how are they serving us? Mm -hmm. as a society, as individuals, and how are they hindering us? Perhaps we should be having conversations about how just the, the, the norms that we have around relationships, that people feel isolated, or how healthy is it for us to have these default expectations of getting all of our needs met through our, our spouse? Why is it that we just assume that we should lose sexual interest over time in our partnership and that is okay? Why do we assume that one person has to be the one to, to meet these needs that we have? And really, what is, what is the impact on society of mononormativity? This assumption that we all should be monogamous. It's such beautiful questions, Heath. Like, just so powerful. It's, it, it's introspective. It's like, is this working? How well have those questions been received in the areas where you're trying to make progress. So, I mean, I know I, I, I have a specific route I want to go down, but I'll just leave it really basic first, first run at this. <laughs> sure. Well, we're, we're certainly seeing an increasing level of support, right? It, we are having conversations at higher levels than we ever have. I really think that non-monogamy is entering into the Overton window or where having policy change is now possible in a way that it never has been, right? We have... Rep what does, oh, what's the Overton window? Oh, yeah. So the Overton window is just a concept where uh, I think it's, uh, our origins are in political science, uh, but really it's that there are certain ideas or concepts in a particular culture that have enough societal support mm. to actually have policies that support them. So before, I mean, even five, 10 years ago, we would have been having conversations about consensual non-monogamy and having, for example, it be a protected class and having non-discrimination policies, or that allowing pe more than two people to enter into a domestic partnership or marriage that would have been laughed at, right? Or it, it, mm. it, there wasn't enough awareness. There mm -hmm. was too much stigma and oppression and society wasn't ready to have those conversations or Got weren't it. open mm -hmm. to supporting it. Similar to where, you know, in the 1920s uh, or 10s talking about interracial marriage, right? No way. Like opposition was in the 90% mm -hmm. now, or, you know, only in the 5%. Now, interracial marriage, there's, it's like over 95% of people in the U.S. support that. Similar, mm -hmm. we've seen trends around same-sex relationships mm -hmm. uh, and how rates have exponentially increased over the past 15 or 20 years, right? But at, at, at different times, it wasn't possible to pass those laws mm -hmm. and policies, and now it is. And I think it's an, it's an it. interesting you. question. How fast will this go? Mm -hmm. Where will this go? Right, because I think what's interesting about non-monogamy is that 5% of people in the U.S. And, and Canada are currently engaging in it, but a recent survey came out and found that 33 or 34% of people in the United States indicate that some form uh, of non-monogamy or that their ideal relationship structure is something other than strict monogamy. So you have over wow. a quarter of people in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and those in the U.S., who are not practicing or engaging in the relationship structure that's aligned with their relationship orientation. Wow. Yes. And feeling it. And I think that's why people listen to Amory podcast, you know, many people and, and so many of the podcasts out there to start normalizing and say, Hey, what's, mm -hmm. what's going on? Are you doing this? How are you doing this? 
um, right. and people looking for support, of course. So yep. Overton window, got it. And yes, I, mm. I wholeheartedly agree. I think it is reaching that that tipping point. You were a part of the first, the policy, I think one of the first policies to be changed in Massachusetts, right? Around, um, oh, fill in the blank here plural, for me. Plural, like, plural domestic partnership and there we go. non-discrimination. Yes. Okay. A, plural a domestic partnership. These are words and phrases. I, I They don't roll off my tongue just yet, <laughs> but well, I, I want them because, to. Because, because people don't know. Because uh -huh. we're not, we're also, this isn't a concept. Just like, I don't know, uh, uh, being queer was ha had a certain association or even the language around the LGBT community and how that has evolved over time. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a similar thing here that even part of the challenge and even one of the impacts of mononormativity is that there's there's not dialogue around it like we don't even know what people didn't even think that it was uh, have have it on their radar to think about the fact that it's okay or normal or healthy to be attracted to someone of the of the opposite or mm -hmm. the same sex mm -hmm. similarly i think we're still in the nascent stages of our broader identity development around people even knowing that it's okay or to perceive relationship orientation as an orientation that is similar to Yes, exactly. And how do we do that? How do we communicate that without language? And we need language yeah. to be invented. I mean, language. the word polyamory exactly. was, I think it wasn't it one right. of the authors of the, or the authors of the ethical slut that came up with that uh, term or, or came up with uh, compersion, maybe compersion was it, but like th these words are fairly new in the last couple of decades. Yeah. I think that it was, um, there was a community in the 1990s, a uh, 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 polyamorous community in the 1990s uh, that called the Christia, Christia, Krista community, Krista community, that I believe is uh, where the term polyamory came from, but don't quote me on that. I believe that's what- Actually, whatever. I was sent a book of someone. I didn't end up interviewing them and maybe I'll circle back because I, I think that it was described in their book. So, okay. Uh, Emory listen, listeners to be, to be noted in future <laughs> podcasts. But, <laughs> but yeah, yes. thank you. Uh -huh. So with, with Massachusetts and, this, and the, the work that's happening there, Essentially, what, what unfolded is we already had the Committee on Consensual Non-Monogamy. We had a legal issues team that uh, was focusing on creating resources, doing uh, empirical work, focusing on supporting families and relationships and some of the legal issues that people were facing. And then kind of out of nowhere, Somerville and this city council person named J.T. Scott uh, passed the first plural domestic partnership ordinance where it allowed people to have more than one domestic partner with the consent of everyone involved. And so we were already doing some work around this issue. And then when that news came out, our team came together and we we're like, okay, let's, let's respond to this. This is, this is really important. This is historic. Let's put together a dream team mm -hmm. of people who are wanting to uh, focus more on supporting this issue. And so then we reached out and at the same time in response to that, uh, some of my colleagues at the Chosen Family Law Center, as well as Harvard Law's LGBTQ clinic, they were coming together and having similar conversations. We, it, the field is only so big, right? Eventually we mm -hmm. came together and we're like, okay, let's build a team. And that's where the Polyamory Legal Advocacy Coalition came together. And really what, what happened from there is we reached out to the city council persons and we, uh, reviewed what they did. We made a number of recommendations to make it a little bit more secure and robust and inclusive to additional groups. Um, and uh, then we also uh, reached out and worked with different contacts that we had in that area and uh, worked with the city of Cambridge as well as Arlington. And then taking the, the template or of our updated model for that pol that ordinance and then they and then supported them through the process through expert testimony and engaging in conversations and questions that they might have along the way backing it up with research that we had on the topic justifying the need and lo and behold uh those two passed uh so now people can uh go with their polycule and they can uh take a trip to somerville because there's no residency requirements and you can hang out in some of the hipster coffee shops and uh, have a, a weekend. And as long as everyone is consenting, you now can have more than two people on your as a domestic partner. And really where that comes in handy is because then let's say that you and I are married, uh, Megan, and uh, let's say that 
you have health insurance and I have health insurance, but maybe Marty mm -hmm. does not. And mm -hmm. uh, this way, you and I wouldn't have to get divorced and that one of us just could get into a domestic partnership with Marty. And then we could use our employer's health insurance to then cover, cover Marty. We have more flexibility. We have more choice in that regard. Yes. And, then and more shared the, the resources. Second, yeah. That's right. That's right. And then the, the other piece with this, I'll just briefly mention is, so one of the problems was, so we could do that, but then we could go and get fired on Monday after our wedding because there's no legal protections uh, in the workplace. So one of the other initiatives that we're focusing on is non-discrimination or making it a protective mm -hmm. class. So in child custody cases or in the workplace, you don't have to worry as much about losing your job or losing custody of your kids and non-monogamy being weaponized against you. So mm. now we've officially passed the first uh, we supported Somerville again uh, on the other end and helping uh, with this issue of uh, protecting the people that are getting plural domestic partnerships. Um, and now that is the first city that's passed. Cambridge is moving along and will likely be the second city. And then there's other cities in the in the West Coast, such as uh, Berkeley and Oakland, mm -hmm. that are in the process of um, likely passing similar non-discrimination ordinances. Oh, that's fantastic. We, we need yeah. this, a system ch a systems change. You know, we can change culturally, we can make more room for it, but until our policies and laws are right there supporting it, we will still be swimming upstream. So thank you. I'm so glad that there are people working on this. I know that that is totally not my forte. <laughs> not at all. I'm like, I will be in the, the camp of normalizing this by speaking about it, by sharing, but we need this policy change. Uh, what's interesting too is I have a friend um, that is in, uh, I think, a polyamorous V, and she got both of her partners on the birth certificate of their child. So, so exciting. yeah, or at least was working on it. So I'm yeah. hoping to interview her on that process as well. It, this just, yeah. you know, there are so many hindrances actually to to this experience of loving more than one person and, and having committed relationships with more than one. I remember walking through airports and like, you know, we go up to the gate, get, you know, pass, uh, stamping our passport, like all together. It's just like all of these tiny little exp experiences every day of, yeah. okay, that's only for the nuclear family. So this is yep. really comical, but I will share with, there's a rock climbing gym that just opened up here and we were getting a, we we're getting a family pass and <laughs> Marty went in there and Marty was like, look, we're in a polyamorous relationship. I've got two partners. <laughs> yes, I Marty, want, can, I want both of come my on. partners on the family pass. And they said, yes, That's right. come on. Love that. So Love that. I know. So it's so simple, but it's like, it, even that you can start to see how people start feeling excluded. Like his partner would yep. have been excluded in that. Yep. And it's just, it's like, right. It's like nails on the chalkboard. Like, oh, yet again, oh. I'm experienced as not a part of this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Car insurance, uh, health insurance, right? There, there are so many ways that there's just this erasure toward non-monogamous families and relationships. And I think especially the, the, the core of non-monogamy is about ethics and honesty and transparency mm -hmm. and really creating systems of mutual care, which liberals and conservatives can both agree that we all want that, right? So how do we start having conversations? And that's really the motivation behind um, launching this institute, the, the Modern mm. Family Institute. Yeah. That my colleague, Dr. Lily Lamboy, and I are, are, are launching because really the work that we've been doing it, with these other groups, we're all volunteering our time, right? With the Committee on Consensual Non Monogamy, with the Polyamory Legal Advocacy Coalition, these groups of individuals, myself included, we're, we're donating our time. And really where we're at, I think, in this movement is really needing to scale. So it's it, it, there's certainly vulnerability in that. And I'm taking a leap in terms of moving away from, uh, 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 some of the other work that I'm doing in terms of my private practice and coaching and limiting that and taking a leap and trying to fundraise mm -hmm. so that we can build a budget and bring more people into doing this work. Because yes. I really believe now is the time, again, that it's in the Overton window, that we're in the early stages, we're starting to have success and see changes happening. So it just, it just really felt like the right time uh, to take that leap of faith, if you will, and, and I have try to create a nonprofit. 
Seriously, I congratulate you. And I know it's just the beginning. And I know that you're in that kind of, yeah, like you said, that scary leap of yeah. dedicated more of your time trying to fundraise. You you right. were, it is in conjunction with the University of California, UC Berkeley, right? Or is that, yeah. is it Great under question. an umbrella there? So how are you Great structuring question. that? What are your yep. initiatives? Yeah, what yep. I would love to dig in more into the Modern Family Great. Institute. Yeah, so that really depends on funding. So essentially through my, because I, uh, used to work at UC Berkeley and have close ties there. And there's a lot of support and curiosity and interest in this topic because it's very much aligned with who Berkeley is and, and what Berkeley stands for. And so where things are now is that we have an open door, that if we're able to fundraise enough money, right, that uh, it's it's a little bit opaque, but my that essentially we need to raise around a million dollars to launch an institute at UC Berkeley on this mm -hmm. topic. If we raise less than that in this first round, the plan will be that we will launch a project and essentially establish a position or a couple positions or a program at UC Berkeley mm -hmm. and then work in conjunction with that program. Because then from that place, we would then have the university support and backing in, in terms of doing additional fundraising, applying for grants. We have that institutional credibility as well as just continuing to cultivate the relationships that I have there and really establishing a home base uh, at UC Berkeley. So the plan is launch the Institute, which we're in the early stages of doing. I'm so thankful for all of the support that we are receiving um, from colleagues and friends and family and, and other psychologists and lawyers and people across the world, really, that wow, are really excited yes. and see the synergy behind this. And so we actually are it just formed the 501c3 and are opening our account and so excited uh, to be launching this initiative. Yeah, it is. There's Well, congratulations, because in any endeavor, there are these milestones and it is, you know, sometimes just a piece of paper, like we are official 501c3 <laughs> and it is such a big deal because that's the, right. that's the beginning. So it sounds yeah. like it's going to happen no matter what. It's really a matter of scale. Like how quickly right. does it grow? So it's either going right. to grow on this path or grow on that path. What, right. where are you looking for your funds from? How, how do you view fundraising? It is it crowdsourcing? Yeah. Is it looking for major donors? What are, what is the yeah. plan there? Yeah, we're going to do a bit of both. Certainly crowdsourcing and uh, major donors to start will also be applying for grants. Um, mm -hmm. Even some of the challenge right now is that non-monogamy, there's still enough stigma toward non-monogamy that it, it can be difficult to uh, bring in the large grants. So we're hoping or anticipating that to start, the most likely scenario will be a large donor or donors that can really just mm -hmm. scale this and make this more easeful for us to not have to dedicate a ton of time to fundraising and really just jumping in with the work uh, that we already have inroads into doing uh, and then just pouring gas and really scaling that work, right? Because we already yeah. have our irons in many fires and it's really stoked and ready and really we just need uh, i think an ideal scenario a, a couple large-scale donors that can really make this scale and take off nice i i large large donors if you're out there <laughs> find me <laughs> <laughs> so i know that you're going to be focusing a lot on research policy um, and education are those the kind of fundamental pillars of the modern institute mm, modern family yes. institute or there's four research policy practice and education oh, so nice. the research part of it we'll just continuing to do the research projects that we are working on both conducting uh novel uh peer-reviewed research but really wanting to have it be um practical or applicable so applied research is, is really what we're going to hone in on so it's not just staying behind you know mm. in, in the ivory tower but really just looking at what do what do these communities need and not just polyamorous families and relationships, mm -hmm. but any family and relationship that kind of fall outside of the nuclear norm. So doing a needs and uh, analysis more broadly about what modern families and relationships are needing. And uh, then also doing some research or granting. So if there's a scholar or scholars that are already doing this work, uh, uh, using a regranting system where people can apply mm. it and essentially we're supporting them with funds is the model there. And then also with education, we're planning on creating a training program. So really supporting people around um, their, in terms of 
providing psychotherapy or support for uh, therapists, for coaches, but also the general public around how to navigate modern families and relationships and just really filling the gaps of the needs and trying to normalize their experience and offer practical support uh, for them to do that work. So we see that as this way of both providing a service, but also we're wanting to be thoughtful of uh, providing financial security to the Institute as well. So we're not just having to rely only on mm -hmm. donations. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of the uh, policy work, continuing the work that we're doing on the policy front, uh, both with the polyamory legal advocacy coalition, as well as organizations such as the Organization for Ethical Non-Monogamy and Polyamory, and just the work that we've been doing on that front, both at the municipal level, as well as within healthcare institutions. For example, mm. my colleagues and I, through the Committee on Consensual Non-Monogamy, are working on passing uh, the first position statements within the American Psychological Association. And we're drafting what's called a report that acts as the empirical foundation for then any policy statements, such as encouraging psychologists to collect more research or mm. using non-biased clinical practices or routinely asking about relationship orientation when gathering data so that we can change because we can't, we can't change what we don't see, right? So mm -hmm. we have to measure and collect data first. And so, continuing to focus on the policy work. And then finally, with the clinical practice is starting a clinic and creating a space, a safe space that people can come when they're wanting to open their relationship or when they're experiencing challenges of uh, that that come from increased isolation. Um, and so really just wanting to, to create a, a place where people can, can come to receive care around all of that. Oh my goodness. Yes. I'm so looking forward to this existing and I know it's going to be a, you know, definitely work getting there, but yeah, I, I guess when you dream of this, what does it look and feel like in 10 years, in 20 mm -hmm. years, what is that like vision that is pulling you yep. forward that you just are anchored yep. in? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I think that we just have the budget to support this work because it's mm -hmm. so needed that we have, uh, you know, a medium to large staff with directors of each of these programs that we're really providing perspective that we're not just working here in the United States, but really looking international to yes. offer guidance and support and really just be a catalyst for having thoughtful dialogue about this topic. And really my dream is that there would be bipartisan support. I think in some ways I, I draw a lot of inspiration from organizations such as MAPS and the psychedelics movement, mm -hmm. for example, right? And just really how they are focusing on what this, it's this, this concept that used to be or was perceived as radical. And through dialogue and education about the potential benefits and what thoughtful use of psychedelics can look like in terms of mental health care, right, that we have an opportunity to really have greater impact and support a higher number of families and relationships by really being thoughtful about how this appeals to a bipartisan audience and really mm -hmm. being thoughtful about focusing our work not in kind of the polar extremes, mm -hmm. but really being thoughtful of this framing of how do we support creating healthy families and relationships. Mm. It seems so simple, right? Like, doesn't everybody mm. get behind that? Healthy families and relationships. That's like right. that is, I, it's almost astounding to me that that seems revolutionary, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and just where we're at right now and that, um, yeah. Yeah, that it's not the focus yeah. or that even health, you know, health in general hasn't been much of a focus, physical, mental, emotional, right. or spiritual health. And, you know, right. you know, that's where my heart is in all yeah. of the self-love work yeah. that I do. And yeah, right. really bringing people to understand and be accountable for our personal health. But this is us being accountable for our health uh, on a much larger scale, on a much larger yep. scale, which I think we need. Yeah. I love that vision, Heath. I really, I can see it. I love your vision of it being 
international because, I mean, I know through Amory, I've connected to so many people that have podcasts of their own in Brazil, in Australia, in Europe, in South America, here in Costa Rica. I mean, there's just so many people that are out there talking about this, looking for resources, kind of building this underground network of like, hey, hey, where are you at? How are you supporting people? Where are your challenges? And there are challenges. Like, let's be real. You're a therapist. Like, (laughs) you see the challenges of people working through this. And I don't know if you want to speak to that. You're your work as a as a therapist, as a coach, as yeah. really yeah. being on the ground supporting yeah. people that are working yeah. with the the complications that comes with, you know, complicated yeah. relationship structure. Yep. Yep. I, I yeah, so it and I do have the good fortune of I, I love doing international work and I am, am so grateful for the coaching and therapy that I get to do. And because really we're in this place where an increasing number of people are coming online to this. It, to, it reminds me of the early conversations that we had about queerness and mm-hmm. it's starting to feel safer for people to acknowledge that mm-hmm. I'm in a relationship perhaps, and I just don't quite feel fully authentic or fully myself. Can we please just have dialogue around mm-hmm. that? And I think so much now we're, we're seeing, I'm seeing so much, so many couples that I, it reminds me of like when you're in a relationship, I, I think of how, how, much less infidelity mm-hmm. how much less hardship heartache would happen if it would there was safer to have these conversations about relationship orientation sooner if we saw relationship orientation as being similar to sexual orientation and that we treated yes. it with the same level of respect a third yeah. of relationships experience sexual infidelity and three quarters of the people that find out about it end up leaving their partner or ending the relationship and what could have mm-hmm. been an otherwise healthy relationship how many of those people if it was safer to talk about how they want to structure their relationship and what feels authentic to them in terms of meeting both their security needs and their novelty needs within the context of that relationship Mm. how much healthier would it be if there was space to have that dialogue earlier on yes i remember a couple years ago before i started the podcast where i realized uh, you know add that everything that you just said and people are raising kids in these relationship containers that get busted Mm -hmm. open in a traumatic way when that happens and then kids are left with this trauma of their stable you know like the their stable attachment figures not being healthy right. in those moments. And, right. you know, it just, it's like this trauma begets right. trauma right. and and then people right. cut off relationships. Right. That's actually, I think the biggest travesty is like, right. we take a relationship, we just like chop it off like a limb. Like, right. I don't know. Right. I just, to me, that feels so unhealthy. So yeah, this does require a whole skill set of being able to have these difficult conversations, right? Yeah. Because we do have a nervous system and we could be talking with a partner that's like, what you're saying is making me feel really uncomfortable or I am feeling threatened in the relationship. So it's not, I realize it's not as simple as, Oh, we just need to create a space to talk about this. No, to me, it's kind of, I dig down deeper. I'm like, we actually need the fundamental skill set of how do we manage our nervous system when it gets uh, compromised and dysregulated? How do we have awareness around that? And just like, to me, these are like layered skills. We kind of need to be working on all of it policy from the top down and Emotional totally. regulation totally. from the bottom up. <laughs> totally. Because it all, it all paints a picture, right, of I think of how much more difficult was someone who may identify as bisexual being in a marriage and then trying to talk about that in the 70s, about how maybe as a guy that was attracted to a man. And how, it's like the, the mononormativity adds an additional layer of complication, just like how our oppression towards sexual orientation and how that was mm-hmm. wrong or that people were mm-hmm. ill or there was something wrong with them if they had attraction or experienced authentic attraction to someone of the same sex, that was something they had to overcome. It they, 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 they was even harder to be authentic and talk about that because there was this assumption there was something wrong with you. And yes. we're experiencing a similar pressure or opposition today when it comes to experiencing attraction to more than one person or wanting to have your philosophical or your spiritual or religious beliefs that really are maybe aligned with compersion or moody thought, right? Or having, taking this joy in the joy of others and just not believing mm-hmm. that we should get all of our needs met through one person, right? Because I see it's certainly, it's an identity or orientation to so many people. Mm-hmm. And how is not being able to talk about that or even having it on our radar? 
Because if people experience that, similar to experiencing sexual orientation or experience same sex attraction, you're like, oh, there's something wrong with me, or oh, that's mm-hmm. not, there's, there's not a place, or I shouldn't talk about that, or I should, I should really suppress that part of me. What if? society were to shift and there were enough policies to pass and there were enough committees within subdivisions of prominent institutions such as the American Psychological Association and we had laws that really talked about how this is normal and healthy and we did research to really explore that and understand that and at some point in our lives we saw this be similar to the shift that we saw with sexual orientation and people just felt Mm -hmm. more safe talking about their relationship orientation as well. Yeah. Oh, I love that vision of the future. I hold that same vision, Heath. I really do. And to me, I think the biggest travesty is that this is non-monogamy is pathologized, you know, and not even other people telling you you're wrong, but like people believing that they are wrong. Yes. And that to me, it just breaks my heart. It's like wrong for, for being able to experience more love, like being able to appreciate someone Uh, wanting a physical connection, which is just one form of connecting. We do all types of other different connecting, you know, mental and emotional. I I don't know. At some point, I really do see this as the, it like it will happen. It's just a question of how long will it take? And I I think the work that you're doing is definitely moving the needle forward. I mean, I don't know anyone else right now that is working on an initiative, I guess, this big or with this many different ties or having the, having, I guess, the connections that you do. Uh, to really move forward, yeah. like move the needle yeah. forward on policy, education, support, yeah. and the difference right. that, that could yeah. make yeah. 10, 20 years down the future. Yeah, it's exciting, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's really exciting. And and your comment about that internalized shame, my colleagues and I published a study a couple of years ago that, that coined the concept of internalized non-monogamy negativity, similar to internalized homophobia, and really acknowledging the impact that people have, similar to that negative internalized judgments based on what societal perceptions of of sexual and romantic attraction should look like in terms of gender. Mm -hmm. We essentially took that same concept and and did a study and identified that, yep, people that are non-monogamous, that are consensual non-monogamous, feel because of that minority stress of mononormativity, feel that internalized shame, and that has understandable negative impacts on both their own uh, mental and emotional well-being as well as the health of of their relationship. So it's certainly um, important for us to be doing research and work around that because it's those types of conversations that convince psychologists that, okay, wow, yeah, this there there is something that we should do. And oh, by yes. the way, there's over 15 million people that are practicing it currently in the United States. And oh, by the way, a third of people say that they're actually would prefer to be practicing <laughs> this in the United States. Maybe, maybe we as a field should do something about this and start simply asking questions and gathering data about it. Oh my gosh, you think? Yeah. <laughs> And you put it that I way. I mean, I do. I do. Yeah, you do. You do a little bit. Um, <laughs> I think it's so crazy. Half the people, half the people that come to me have talked to yeah. at least one therapist that has yeah. pathologized their desire to want to love or relate to intimately more than one person at a time. Like yeah. really, really. And these are people that are educated and they are your, you know, totally. your fellow <laughs> therapists yeah. out there, but there's so much training that's needed in that realm too. Um, so yeah. anybody listening, if you've ever talked with a therapist that hasn't had room or, you know, doesn't yeah. either doesn't have personal experience or hasn't gone through training around this to create and hold an unbiased space, like it's common. Yeah. There are, there are more people out there and I know right. obviously you are one of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's more training. There's trainings that are out there. There's trainings that are coming and I'm excited for us to get our training up and launched through the modern family Institute. Um, and, and yeah, to, to, to normalize we, so my colleagues and I also did, a study, this actually derived from my dissertation, actually, from grad school. Um, and we put together a large scale study asking people about their experiences in non monogamy, right? And I think it's still the largest study that was out there that has looked into this. Um, and what we found was that some of the most common mistakes that therapists make, and even well meaning therapists, right, mm-hmm. is blaming <clears throat> non monogamy for the issues that people mm-hmm. experience. And, and one of the most common things that that ends up happening is that when people in a non-monogamous relationship experience challenges or difficulties, that there's this proclivity to blame non-monogamy 
more mm-hmm. than there is for monogamy, right? I think that how many of us, you know, when, when you hear about a non-monogamous couple, for example, that has had difficulty or that broke up, there's this privilege to be like, oh, well, yep, see, it's because they're trying to have their cake and eat or two or whatever. Mm-hmm. But how many monogamous relationships do you know that crashed and burned royally? <laughs> Uh, but we never assume that it's it's not like oh well they're it's because they're attempting monogamy. There's this double standard totally. that's in effect. But when the data suggests that non-monogamous relationships, on average, last just as long, tend to be just as healthy. In some markers, tend in terms of communication and even sexual satisfaction, they tend to score a little bit higher on average. Mm-hmm. Right. So in in many ways, non-monogamy is not a panacea. But it also should not be stigmatized in the way it is. And so many of the assumptions that people have about the health and well-being of non-monogamy is simply just not wrong. It is biased. It is it is not rooted in fact. It is rooted mm. in the stigma that exists towards mm-hmm. non-monogamous relationships. That's so hard to see because that's still the water we swim in. And that's that's right. why you're doing the work that you're doing. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Is there any, I mean, I know that you're very passionate about a lot of things. Is there anything else that you are passionate about that you want to share that I haven't asked you about? Oh my goodness. Uh, let's see there. I mean, there is a lot, I, I think, you know, the, the, where my passion lies right now is just really, I think going into really understanding the impact of mononormativity I think other other ideas that come to mind as well as even in in is with sexless marriages, for example, and how 15% of marriages are sexless, and that is even more when uh, that's defined by having sex uh, zero times in the past year. It goes up even more in terms of percentage. Uh, I think of how how is mononormativity really impacting the quality of the sexual and emotional connection that people have by assuming that we should get all of our needs met through one person Mm -hmm. or or how might it shift our conversation around that issue. But also another one is domestic violence. Mm -hmm. 80% or some figures show that up to 80% of instances of domestic violence are rooted in romantic jealousy. And how might mononormativity are not talking about compersion or not normalizing how over the course of a long-term relationship, it is really common to both want security, but also experience attraction to other people. And if we aren't talking about that, if we aren't infusing in our narrative Mm -hmm. of what a healthy relationship looks like, helping people navigate that or, or say that, hey, this is normal. And here are some coping strategies or ways of Uh, having conversation around that so you can still create security in your relationship and really preparing people to have conversations about jealousy instead of just ignoring the issue or Mm -hmm. assuming that then there's something wrong with somebody for experiencing attraction outside of the relationship. So I'm really spending a lot of my time and energy holding a lot of curiosity about these large scale impacts of mononormativity. Yes. And I see it, you know, we are in a system (laughs) and this is like a lever that I think as we turn it could have a lot, a lot of implications. And what you just said there and the way that people relate and in lowering domestic violence and extending out uh, long-term relationships and having healthier families for kids to be raised in. I mean, all of it, I see it all is so connected. It's also yep. kind of like a game of pickup sticks where you're like trying to pick up one and it like touches all these other pieces. Yep. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It's going to take a lot of voices, a lot of support. Um, how, what can we do from here? What are calls to action to mm-hmm. support your initiatives? Um, and you've mentioned a couple associations that you work with, and I will make sure to include this in the show notes. Um, right. But if there are yep. calls to action for any of the associations that you're working with, or if people want to find out more information, yes. I will make sure yes. that... Yeah. yeah. Wait, everybody can do their, their homework after this conversation because there's a lot yes. of touch points here. <laughs> you know, and I guess one last one I'll, I'll use as a kind of catalyst to have that conversation is I know a lot of people right now um, are experiencing uh, concerns about coming out or talking openly about non-monogamy and certainly want to put a plug for those people that have the privilege to do so. Mm-hmm. And 
one of the ways it's, you know, there's different forms of coming out. It's with our family, it's with our friends, but it's also in the workplace. And one, one other thing I want to note, because I think it's important, is that there's work being done in terms of offering support for non-monogamy in the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, one organization that I'm working with, I'm on the board of the Organization for Ethical Non-Monogamy and Polyamory, um, or OPEN, and they have an a project called the Open Workplaces Initiative. I'm getting ready to launch a blog talking about here's some six steps that employers could take to be more inclusive of their non-monogamous um, uh, employees, as well as modern uh, families and relationships, the employees that fall into that category. And so there's uh, an opportunity to certainly learn more when I launch that blog there, but Open has an Open Workplaces initiative. So that's kind of the grassroots level, a way for people to plug in. They can join a Discord server. We're getting ready to, uh, through Open, launch a number of resources that are really geared towards helping people create more support in the workplace and how to have conversations and specific things they can ask for from their employer to be more inclusive. And what we're hoping is by creating these resources and having some institutional support in terms of the research and, and, and uh, work that we've gone into creating those, that, that will help advance those conversations. So certainly encourage people uh, if they want to get involved with open in any capacity, that's a great way just to plug in and build community at that grassroots level. So that's fantastic. That's one organization. Um, then also just plugging in with the Modern Family Institute. It's just modernfamilyinstitute.org. We have an email listserv that we have. And so listeners can certainly follow the work that we are doing there, um, as well as the Polyamory Legal Advocacy Coalition. That more focuses on specific legal support and providing expert witnessing, witnessing mm. and also uh, just really being catalysts for having those conversations and providing um, legislation and model legislation and the technical drafting for the specific policies that folks might want to pass. So all three of those organizations um, are certainly organizations that uh, I would encourage people to plug into and find ways to get connected with based on what their, their specific needs are. Amazing. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And are you still taking clients right now as yes. a coach and therapist? Okay. I, I am still taking uh, clients as a coach and therapist. And so certainly folks outside of the state of California, I'm licensed in California, so I'm able to provide psychotherapy in that context. And then my coaching practice is for folks outside of, outside of the state of California. Fantastic. All right. Uh, anything else that you want to share with our Amory listeners before we sign off? Just thanks for being you. You're beautiful just the way that you are. And just because our systems don't support who you are, it doesn't mean that you are wrong or there's something wrong with you or what you're doing and that there's hope out there. Please join the movement. Plug in. Please find us. We're happy to support you where you are. And let's, let's build a wave of support and progress on this issue. Oh. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Heath. And thank you everyone for listening. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Megan. Bye. I appreciate Bye. it.